So I think that uh, we should start now and um, because we have a long program, a very comprehensive program. Uh, we'll try to, to uh, give you a complete overview of the different search and rescue operation um, and also present you uh, recent uh, technology development of uh, Galileo. So uh, let's start our program of, of today. So my name is Marie-Christine Bonamo. I am the Secretary General of Public Safety Communication uh, Europe. Uh, we are uh, an international association based in Brussels and uh, we are gathering three communities with us, uh, practitioner, industry and researchers, uh, all working in the field of communication and communication system for public safety. We are partner in such a rescue project. I'm very pleased uh, to, um, to undertake uh, all the dissemination and communication activity and to organize this webinar. That's not the first one. Uh, and uh, I will show you uh, the program of uh, our session. Uh, we will start with a presentation of our project uh, with some updates because uh, we have reached now uh, one year and a half of the project. Uh, we'll have the presentation about um, the new developments of uh, Galileo search and rescue services. Um, and then um, we'll have also a presentation about uh, how uh, to train, uh, to be trained to use innovative technology. And uh, we'll have a presentation of the Concord platform. And then we'll have a different presentation looking at different uh, search and rescue operation like uh, intervention of canine uh, teams, uh, also um, mountain rescue training, maritime uh, SNR, and also uh, emergency uh, operation. So, and also CBRN, and not to, to forget this one, uh, which is very important. So, very briefly, some rules for this webinar. Uh, everything will be circulated after the event, so uh, the video and the presentations. Um, participants are all muted. Uh, if you have uh, questions, uh, we have time to, to cover some questions, so please write them under the chat. And uh, as the, the, the webinar is quite long, um, please mention each time to who uh, you, you address. Uh, these questions um, and uh, because for the quality of, of the transmission of this webinar we kindly ask one speaker to turn off the camera. Uh, with this being uh, said uh, I would like uh, to, to, to give the floor uh, to our first speaker uh, who is the coordinator of uh, certain rescue projects. Christos, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. All right. Uh, my name is uh, Christos Danos. I am uh, an electronic and computer engineer and the research director for the Decision Support Systems Laboratory of the National Technical University of Athens. And I am the coordinator of the Search and Rescue Project, which organizes uh, this webinar and is hosted by our partner, uh, PSE Europe. I will spend a few minutes to tell you what the project is all about and present you with its current status. The search and rescue project refers to the development and deployment of emerging technologies for the early location of entrapped victims under collapsed structures and advanced wearables for risk assessment and first responders safety in search and rescue operations. We will briefly see what that means and what technologies and techniques we refer to in the next few slides. The search and rescue consortium is comprised of 28 partners from 12 European countries nine of which are research institutes, six SMEs, five large enterprises, and, none, and nine uh, end users. 
The search and rescue project alongside with other similar efforts falls within the disaster risk and resilience priorities from the UN's 2030 sustainable development agenda. The challenges posed due to climate change, population growth and urbanization amplify the impact of the life-threatening extreme weather conditions brought about by climate change. Even without the mention of the loss of life, cultural heritage and ecosystems, the EU has recorded more than 410 billion euros in damages due to such events. With this in mind, preparedness is key to reducing and even minimizing the effects of natural or man-made disasters. As we have seen recently uh, with the events in Ukraine. This is why first responders and rescue teams need to be equipped with cutting edge tools and specialized instruments in order to enhance their capabilities in terms of accuracy, quick localization and reduction of false alarms. Search and Rescue is an EU funded project under the Horizon 2020 program and it started on the 1st of July 2020 and will be completed on the 30th of June 2023. The key objective of Search and Rescue is to develop and promote the underlying framework, including the interoperability between systems and equipment, training and awareness so that responders at all levels of command have access and can familiarize themselves and evaluate the deployment of innovative solutions. Research and development will continue to produce innovative products, which have to respond to ever-growing threats in a globalized environment, and the project's approach is to find out how to optimally integrate them as on-demand tools in a holistic governance model. The major challenge addressed is to link approaches, technical solutions, procedures and standards for the protection of the European citizen as defined in the European Internal Security Strategy, thus allowing for a faster and more appropriate response to natural, technological and man-made threats in EU countries and, if needed, globally. The Search and Rescue project aspires to demonstrate a consistent crisis governance model, naturally supported by the toolbox concept, covering the role that Europe intends to adopt in implementing the Lisbon Treaty. It considers a strong civil and military mutual support in technologies and operations, as well as public engagement. Emergency responders from multiple entities organize themselves on the field according to existing procedures, different training means and unsorted equipment at local or national level when they are in place. Today, though, we stand at month 21 of the project, just as we are starting to test our equipment and technologies on the field. The Search and Rescue project aims to develop, further advance and combine multiple technologies with varying degrees of adoption for search and rescue operations. Some have never been tested for such a use and others have already been deployed in field operations. These include the Concord Emergency Management System, a cloud-based platform dedicated to crisis management operations, handling information relating to the incident, triage data, instant messaging and notifications. Several wearables and mobiles, including geolocation, straying, ECG and EMG sensors, smartwatches, multi-gas hazmat and radiation sensors and uniforms that combine at, as a emergency response health condition monitoring devices for first responders. Smartphone applications for volunteers that allow knowing the human resources availability in case of an emergency an e-learning platform to enhance participants' understanding, knowledge and skills in terms of safety and security management at operational and strategic levels, as well as to provide training material for the use of the equipment being developed, including videos and practical guides. A first aid kit specifically designed for the use with young victims. Robots and autonomous vehicles with advanced sensors, object detection algorithms using artificial intelligence for collision detection and avoidance. Drones with object detection capabilities for streaming and recording video with AI-based victim localization algorithms operated through a drone collaboration platform that allows the coordination and delegation of tasks between different UAVs and also a 3D mixed reality command center that visualizes contextually relevant and online spatial information from different data sources, making them available to the decision makers. At this point in the project's implementation, the preliminary design and theoretical work has already been completed for the definition phase. The focus shifted through 
towards the implementation and testing of the uh, search and risk platform and the various components and technologies. And we are performing final tests and training of first responders and equipment operators in order to perform the exercises. This will lead to a continuous feedback loop that will allow the technology developers and providers to listen to what the end users have to say about our results and improve them for each exercise that will follow. The timing of the exercises has been carefully adjusted to allow enough buffer for the component owners to develop working and testable versions of the components, depending on the complexity, interoperability requirements and need for laboratory testing. Flexibility plays a very important role in managing to make everything work on the day, and we strive to allow our experience and results to be transparent to encourage their future development and their adoption. The technologies and techniques being developed in search and rescue are going to be validated in seven use case scenarios that will lead to an equal number of exercises on the field. These exercises and their initial planning already elaborated will take place in Italy, Greece, the border between Austria and Germany, France, Romania and Spain. A combination of technologies has been selected for each since the beginning, but has also been expanded during planning to improve the validation efforts. Here's the schedule of those exercises starting from late April in Sicily and June in France, testing various equipment related to scenarios involving victims trapped under rubble. Then in September in Romania, we will be testing the response to a terrorist attack using CBRN at an airport and in the border between Austria and Germany, we are going to perform a cross-border pilot exercise focusing on communication coordination, which, in which a heavy storm has caused a total blackout and loss of communications, while during the search and rescue operations, a large gas explosion occurs. Then in November, two exercises in Greece will take place, one involving, involving a forest fire scenario, threatening an industrial zone, testing safety and remote sensing technologies, and another for a mountain rescue of victims of a plane crash, testing technologies for risk assessment, crisis management, and rescue and vol volunteer mobilization. The exercise will finish in mid-December in Spain with an exercise involving a CBRN incident with two separate scenarios, one relating to a collapsed residential building and the second relating to a resulting explosion and ammonia leak, where coordination, decision support, communication and wearable and handheld technologies and devices will be tested. Regarding the first use case, which is organized by the National Research Council of Italy, it will take place in, uh, on uh, 28th of April in Poggio Reale, a small town and commune in Sicily set in the Belize Valley. The town of Poggio Reale has an important and relevant history. On the night of 15th January 1968, a terrible earthquake raked through the, va the valley. Around 900 people died and 10 towns and villages were significantly damaged. Poggio Reale was left in ruins and after assessing the damage, it was decided that rebuilding the town on the existing site would be too costly and so a new area was proposed a few kilometers down the valley. Since then, the area has been ideal for performing exercises that simulate earthquakes and this is the reason it was selected for search and rescue. In the exercise to be performed there, we are going to simulate people being trapped under the rubble and in premises not reachable uh, as a consequence of the earthquake, the release of gases, and other toxic uh, substances, as well as blocked roads preventing traditional vehicles to reach the area. In this scenario, we are going to test the Concord platform, the GPS, the strain sensors, the EG and EMG sensors, the strategic or, uh, organizational and tactical uh, level decision support system, which supports efficient resource allocation, for example, EMS units from stations to incidents, patients to EMS units and hospitals, actors to tasks and estimating casualties, the physio decision support system, which helps in forecasting the evolution of a physiological status of the crisis victims, providing a simulation of a set of different crisis scenarios and information to help in handling a real crisis situation from the victim management perspective, the drones and the detection capabilities developed for them, smart uniforms and the rescue system for children. The scenario of the exercise has been built and we are currently finalizing and testing the equipment and training the first responders for using it and planning the last details for recording it and detailing the feedback we plan to obtain from the end users. We are very eager to test what this last 21 months of hard work have produced. I hope you will be with us again 
after a few exercises have taken place, where we will be able to give you more details on the successes and challenges we faced. You can follow our project's developments on Twitter and LinkedIn, as well as through our website, searchandrescue.eu. On behalf of the project, I would like to thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Christos, for, for this presentation of the, of the project. Um, that is uh, rather uh, complete and uh, show all our activities. Uh, I would like to, to give the floor now to uh, Mr. Kouri from the uh, European Commission, who will present um, the Galileo Search and Rescue Services. Uh, please, uh, Claude, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marie Christine, thank you all for attending today. Uh, I'm always very impressed to see the number of competencies that we find in such meetings. I mean, it's very various, and uh, sometimes I feel a bit humbled to to just come with one service, which is the search and rescue service from Galileo. But uh, I must say, actually, that uh, the space program of the European Union has much more uh, in its back that could help you for the rescue operations. For example, uh, this week, actually, on the 17th of March, the cell phones sold in Europe, all the cell phones that are sold in Europe, have Galileo-enabled chipsets. So that will allow for a more precise 112 call and, of course, the deployment of AML. And as uh, Christoph just said, when you have a situation, earthquake or something that uh, leads to very complicated situation on the terrain, of course, Copernicus and its Earth observation system can help taking pictures of the region and um, help you to draw new maps and to draw new cards <clears throat> and, and, and see where your vehicles can go through. So that is also an asset. But it's, it would be too wide. I remember that the organizer kindly asked me to stick into 20 minutes, which would be a problem for me because I love to talk about the things I love. And so I propose you to start immediately uh, with Galileo and the search and rescue service. I think the first thing to know is what is Galileo? Well, Galileo, some of you have heard of it, some of you did not, because it's a system that is rather new on the market. It is actually the contribution of the European Union to COSPA SARSAT for the search and rescue service, but basically it has also other services that work, let's say, like the GPS. I mean, the people always or often refer to Galileo as the European GPS, which is nice. But when we tell the Americans, our American friends, that actually uh, Galileo is more accurate, more precise than the GPS, they are a bit offended. So please don't tell them that they, it doesn't make them happy. And I must say uh, the cooperation is quite good because the uh, the services, the signals produced by Galileo are fully interoperable with the GPS signals. What that means is that your receiver, uh, be that a smartphone, a handheld receiver, a car equipment, whatever, will understand the positioning signals exactly the same way between the GPS and Galileo. And that, of course, will increase the number of satellites in view of your system and it cares for a greater accuracy. We have uh, two main services uh, in the PNT zone, so positioning, timing, and navigation. The open service is navigation. It's, let's say, like the GPS, but better. And then we have the PRS. PRS is a restricted, a robust, and encrypted signal that is available only for EU member states. And um, it will be used for uh, civil protection, uh, sometimes for high level rescues for the military for whatever uh, whatever service that the member state can deem it fit for the focus for today for me um will be uh, sorry someone pushed somewhere so i don't know how i can recover my presentation uh very sorry about this uh i think i will take it like this 
it should work. No, it doesn't. Okay, I will. Ah, I think I have a problem, guys. So rescue is a good thing, but uh, if you don't manage the IT tool, um, I guess you're a bit in trouble. Try to stop sharing and share again. Uh, yeah, I will try that because uh, that was a non-expected issue. So let me check um, how can I do that. Um, we'll get there, no worries. It's always good when you are talking about rescue to have uh, some kind of uh, a real crisis situation. It puts you really in the mood of uh, of showing if you are able to do the job. Um, where are we here? Does that work? Yes. Excellent. So we are back on track. Uh, I hope I will get two extra minutes for that from my time. Uh, so no, no joke now. Um, search and rescue service is uh, the service I'm going to talk about it uh, in detail today. What we do now, what we will do in the future. It is a contribution to the international network Kospar Sarsat. On that, uh, I must say that uh, the politicians who took the decision of integrating the search and rescue service into Galileo, that was back in 97, they had a genius idea because it would have been quite easy to say, well, we are building Galileo as an independent system, so we will also build a separate search and rescue system. And that would have made actually the life of the people in the control centers, in the rescue centers, much more complicated because they would have had one more uh, system to, to deal with. So they, they looked at what was available on the market or in the world at that time, and they saw that Kospar Sarsat had incredible results, uh, very good efficiency, and a somehow aging space equipment. So they decided actually to put the capacity of the whole Galileo constellation in terms of search and rescue at disposal of Kospar Sarsat. I said just that uh, Kosparsat has an impressive uh, result uh, record. Just for reference, keep in mind that the system as it was before Galileo joined was saving something like seven lives a day thanks to their system. So that is an amazing number per year of people who got home while actually they wouldn't have uh, survived otherwise. A uh, second advantage is that the network of Kospar Sarsat uh, linking all the rescue station was in place and the EU contributed so that the system could still be free of charge. How does that work? I mean, you have beacons, that is mandatory. If you want to be found by the Kospar Sarsat system, you need a beacon. You have three times, and from right to left, you have the ELTs. ELTs are designed to be put on aircraft, helicopters, or whatever thing that flies. You have EPERPs. These are more uh, aimed to maritime. They are in uh, waterproof uh, casings. They can pop up to the surface in case that a boat is sinking too fast and then start transmitting automatically. And then you have the PLBs, the portable location beacons on which I will uh, focus today. These are the side, the size, sorry, of about a cell phone, a modern cell phone. They cost something like 250, 300 euros. And of course, they all are certified for emergency uses. They use 406 megahertz uh, transmission. And that fact is uh, one of the criteria for approval by Kospar Sarsat. So uh, the network as it is for, for Kospar Sarsat is that you have the Meolutz antennas that will receive the signal from the satellites. You have the MCCs, so the mission control centers, and you have the RCCs, so those are the local rescue centers. What happens is that you have a beacon starting to transmit to a satellite. The satellite just copy-pastes the signal it received and send it to the Meolut. 
the MEOLUT will do the computation because it will receive the signal from not only one but several satellites. It will do actually a triangulation, pass the result of that computation to the um, MCC, sorry, and the MCC will send it to the local rescue center that can then trigger a rescue operation and a rescue response. So it's quite easy, it just needs to work. So in the beginning, I would say uh, Kosparsar had, had this equipment in space, the LEOSAR. LEOSAR is low orbit. It's about uh, six, between 600 and 800 kilometers altitude. The fact that they are flying low, these satellites, they can detect quite low power beacons, so beacons that don't have a lot of transmission power, and they fly above the pole, which is very convenient to have a polar coverage. On the negative side, because of the fact that they have to fly several times around the Earth, your waiting time uh, before the signal is picked up could be quite long. And in the worst case with this LEOSAR, you might have to wait up to four hours before the signal is picked up. So that means practically that a person in distress is lost in the field, maybe wounded or lost at sea in the cold water or whatever, and has to wait without knowing that anything had happened up to four hours before the processing of the signals can start. That's an amazing long time, especially when you're in distress. I mean, every single minute counts as a full day. Also, uh, the processing of the signals uh, was made on fixed coding, so there was no upgrade possible later, and that is because they were aging satellites. They also had Geosar. Geosar is uh, geosynchronous, so satellites that fly exactly at the same speed as the Earth rotates, and it gives the impression that actually they keep their position all the time. The very positive thing is that because they don't move, well, they see in real time what is happening in their, in their coverage region, but on a negative side, uh, their coverage is limited, and if you have something between your beacon and the satellite, well, it will never change because the geometry is fixed. So, what Galileo brought is the MEOSAR, and the MEOSAR is going to fly between the two altitudes. So, LEO was about uh, 600, 800 kilometers altitude, GEO is something like uh, 36,000 kilometers, and the MEOSAR, the Galileo, they are flying between 22,000 and 23,000 kilometers altitude. Not only that gives them a good coverage, global, but we also have a high number of satellites talking to each other. For the moment, um, Galileo is designed to use 24 satellites. So it's a constellation of 30. We have three orbital planes and eight satellites on each plane and then we have two uh, active spares already there already in space so if one of the satellite would fail or be hit by a space debris or whatsoever we already have the replacement on site it just needs to be moved a bit to take over the place left free by the failing one and then it can start transmitting immediately um, it also has this near real-time detection and location, I will come back on that later. Uh, single burst detection and location means that even if your beacon would just transmit once, there is a very high chance, almost a certainty, that it will be picked up by a Galileo satellite. And then we have the new functionalities and that will be the part of the second, uh, the subject of the second part of this presentation. Of course, it needs a lot of money because, uh, well, you know, 30 satellites, you have to build them, you have to launch them, you have to maintain them in space. But on that, we can say that search and rescue, these devices that are placed in the satellite, so it's not a dedicated satellite, it's just one more equipment on board. Well, it is not that expensive. What is expensive is the ground segment, how to connect the, the antennas with the RCC, etc., etc. 
So if I go for a riddle, how much is the difference between life and death? It's about 15 kilos. What does that mean? Well, it's quite easy. On these Galileo satellites, you have the transponder and you have the antenna. And those are the two only things on the satellite that will make the difference to route the signal from distress beacon to the rescue stations. If we talk money, I told you it was not that expensive. It's only 1% of the Galileo program cost. So really, I mean, for 1%, it would have been stupid to not do it. How does Galileo contribute to MEOSAR? Well, just said we have 24 SAR payloads on Galileo satellites and two that had been launched in December and that has just been uh, established in orbit. We have for Europe only uh, three ground stations, so three MEOLUT and one in deployment in Africa. We contribute, of course, to the alert detection. That is the standard system. You push the button to uh, raise the alert and the system goes to the satellite and to Cosparsarsat. But we are also the first and only, actually, provider of the return link. And the return link is something that we are actually um, extremely proud of. I mean, I must humbly say that's something magic because, remember, it could take take up to four hours before your signal was picked up and then the response is launched, etc., etc. But you, as the person in distress, in the field, in the water, you don't know a single thing. So you can pretty well be depressed and give up the fight and say, well, I'm going to die here. While what the return link will do is that as soon as the signal is received and your position is computed, the return link will send the signal back to the beacon telling, hey guy, we know where you are. And that of course is a game changer. Not only that, up to four hours and 10 kilometers, that's a think of the past with Galileo, we brought the time down to less than 10 minutes, that's on paper, Practically, it's about two minutes and a search radius of two kilometers. And practically, we see that often we are below one and more around 600, 700 meters. So the technology is there, definitely, and it works. The ground station, just to give you an idea how that looks, we have one in uh, Svalbard in Norway, we have one in Larnaca, Cyprus, and one in Maspalomas, Spain, that's for the European SAR segment, and then the one we are building is in La Réunion because there was a black spot, a spot that was totally not covered by a maolit uh, in the water there in the Indian Ocean, and uh, France is building one uh, extra coverage there, so you see it here on the map. We also have reference stations like Santa Maria. They allow us to see that all the signals transmitted are still of the good quality. And we have, let's say, a command center. It's more than that, but uh, it's the main infrastructure in Toulouse, in the premises of the CNES in France. On the map at the right, you see the areas that are covered. So European uh, SAR zone is quite wide and you also have the perspective of uh, La Réunion. The return link service, that's a gem. We still have our beacon transmitting on the left side. What is happening? It goes to the satellite, from the satellite to the Meolutz, um, I, I guess my, my, my colleague here is trying to, <laughs> to tell me something. Okay, I, I will not click accept because otherwise we might lose the presentation again. So the signal went back to the mailets where the position is computed and then it is uh, linked with the MCC to the COSPAR-SASAT network, the Mission Control Center. And it goes to the FMCC, the French Mission Control Center in Toulouse, in the CNES where um, you have two signals going out, one to the RCC, local uh, rescue centers to, to start the rescue, and one to the Galileo ground segment returning service provider. Then 
the confirmation that your position and uh, distress call have been received is encoded in the signal sent back to the satellite by the return link message and from the satellite it is sent back to uh, the beacon and for the moment the indication that you will get on your beacon you you definitely need a, a new generation beacon to do that is that the transmitting light will turn blue so that is how you know that uh, someone knows that's the synoptic so it's exactly the same thing you see go to the satellite mail it's fmcc and mcc about the same time and then rcc so they can already start the operation and at the same time we sent the signal back to the user uh, that's just a reference. The return link has been declared operational since January uh, 2020. The 64th Council of COSPARSA sat in 21 authorized the upgrade to full operational capability, meaning that now it's approved as a worldwide system. And that means also that every single country now can commercialize beacons with the RLS functionality enabled provided, of course, that a country has uh, the possibility to manage the signals. So, um, yeah, I, I, I can understand that you say, well, okay, this is well nice, this is well good, but uh, how well does it work? Because the best system that does not work is not really helpful. I hope you all have a good view, not uh, confusing reds and greens, because this is what we have reached for the last reporting seasons. So June 21 to uh, December 21. The forward link service availability. So um, when is this possibility to, to, to receive any kind of an approved signal from uh, 406? So whatever beacon on the market for the moment that is transmitting on 406. Well, we had committed to 99%. And the best we had in 2021 was 9994, and the worst was 9980. So, I mean, come on, that means that it works. The detection probability, we had committed to 99, and we don't go below 100. After one burst, we said, okay, 90 would be nice. We had 999 in the best case, and oh, really bad 927 the worst but still above the committed uh, performances etc etc i will not force you to read all the numbers you see it's all in green compared to the committed values the return link uh, performance we had committed in the same feeling like 95 percent for the availability we had 99 97 and 99 87 the latency i mean under 15 minutes you see that we are always under 15 minutes and the reception probability so the fact that we will get the uh, this confirmation message uh, in due due time we are also almost 100 percent at the bottom of the slide you will see uh, two links that uh, go to the Galileo Service Center where you can find the service performance report. So every quarter we publish the, uh, how the system performed and also some appreciation from the press. Um, yeah, so since the service declaration, we have received on the beacon the confirmation that the signal was uh, located in an average of 37 seconds so for the person in distress well that's quite a change i mean from waiting up to four hours and having in 37 seconds the confirmation that someone somewhere knows you have a problem and above all knows where you are rls functions really well but um, we can do better and one of the things we heard is that the rescue center say, well, okay, we have problems because uh, an aircraft is no longer responding. I mean, you will all remember the case of Malaysian airline still not found because no one knows where uh, 
where it went. Also the case for maritime a vessel that is overdue, so boat is not coming back home, or a person. The person went for a hike, went for a sailing, went for whatever leisure activity, and is not back home and not responding on the cell phone, etc., etc. Well, we have designed now the remote be beacon activation. And what that means is that uh, an accredited user for aviation, it will be the airline. For maritime, it will be the maritime rescue center. For uh, the person, it will be a coordinator can force the beacon to start transmitting its position and to start transmitting an alert message. So imagine you go hiking or you as rescuers, you have to, to, to provide deliver services in a, in a very, very dangerous zone after an earthquake or something. If you all have one of these PLBs, your reference authority will have the possibility to manage all these beacons. So if one of you would disappear because, uh, I don't know, he fell uh, from the mountain or something, or he fell in, in, in the water in case of floodings, well, this person will probably not have the time to activate the beacon. And his um, coordinator authority can start forcing the beacon to transmit so that uh, it's a normal, normal rescue that starts. So here I will show you basically how that works. I think I have to speed up a bit. Sorry for that. There's so much to say. It starts with the distress phase. Something had happened. You are not sure what. So the accredited user, airline, MRCC, uh, coordinating authority, whatever, is actually sending an activation request to the Galileo service facility. The Galileo service facility encodes it then in the return link message, sends it back to the beacon, and the beacon starts transmitting just as normal. Then you have a usual rescue process based on uh, confirmation of the position and reception of the signal. Pretty useful, still in development, but uh, we are very happy with the, the results so far. We go further. Uh, one of the comments we had from the RCC is, okay, we, we get a distress goal. We, we, we know that something is wrong with some people somewhere. We know the position, but we are not exactly sure what is happening there. With this two-way communication, we can establish an exchange of messages between the RCC, so the local rescue center, and the beacon of the person in distress. These are pre-programmed question. So don't uh, start dreaming about typing your own text, etc., etc., because that would cause more problems than anything else. Imagine that you speak <laughs> that you speak uh, your own language and that uh, the person in distress uh, speaks another language. I mean, imagine uh, I, I saw a lot of you from Greece here. Uh, you speak only Greek or English, and the person in distress only speaks, for example, Japanese. How would you communicate? Well, it's pretty easy, and the system is designed so that the RCC will choose in its own language a question, a question from an interface, and uh, the person will receive that question on the beacon in his or her own language. So there is no translation necessary. It's all encoded in the beacon already. And of course, the same goes for the reply. The reply is also pre-coded in the beacon, in the language of the user, will be sent back and uh, kind of decoded in the RCC language. This project is uh, called Serenity. It was also kicked off under uh, Horizon 2020 program, and we are now doing the first uh, tests in lab. Yes. So, so, sorry, Claude, because uh, if, if you could uh, go to your conclusion, please. Because okay, I will, uh, yeah. I, I will just, uh, yeah, I, I will 
and we can in, in send the information to, to the Serenity project, yeah, of course. Sure, sure, sure. So, okay, how that works is, as you saw, it's exactly the same routing, except that uh, in the Galileo Service Center, we now have an opening to the user interface of the RCC. They can choose the question, send them to the person, and then uh, get the replies from the beacon. So, synoptic view, sorry that I have to rush, but uh, as usual, I spoke uh, too much. This is the way it works. So you can exchange questions, but also send instructions. Meaning that if you want to tell the people in distress something extremely important, like stay on the site, don't move, these uh, informations are also pre-coded and you can send them to the beacon. You can contribute to the list of these questions based on your experience and that would be highly appreciated if you could fill the consultation of which you have the address at the bottom of the screen as the slides will be shared you will have it in um, in your mailbox or something please do that i mean don't hesitate there is no stupid answer there is really uh, a place for imagination as i used to say what you think today is a crazy idea might become tomorrow's life-saving feature in the system so just go wild tell us what you need tell us what is your requirement and we will do the best to integrate it in this new model of beacon so the two-way communication enabled uh, prototype Voila, that was it. Additional resources. Uh, you can get all the technical information you need on Galileo, the SAR, and the way that it works on the Galileo uh, Service Center, gseuropa.eu. You will also get a help desk for developers who want to integrate the signals and uh, all kind of support you might need. You can also check if your cell phones it's a, and other equipment are compatible with Galileo already on this address, usegalileo.eu. Um, for example, on iPhones, the, the cell phones are Galileo enabled since, since model 6S and that was five years ago. This is also the kind of documents, uh, technical documents you can find there. So sorry if I was a bit long. Um, don't hesitate to, uh, to, to, to to get back to, to me or whoever. If you have additional questions on the system, I will be available, of course, to, uh, to reply to you in my best uh, capacity. Thank you, Claude, for, for your um, very, uh, very good presentation. I think it's... Uh, it's impressive to see already what is uh, what is possible and what are the new uh, capability of Galileo. Um, so now we will move to our uh, next speaker, uh, who will present um, the Concorde platform, how it could uh, help to train practitioners to uh, using uh, innovative technology. So, uh, Kalia, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Kalyan Gelaki from Connectable Technologies, and I will present you how practitioners are trained to use innovative technologies, and more specifically, a use case with uh, the Concord platform. It is well known that uh, in every crisis management operation, the main actors are the first responders. These are the firefighters, the police, the medical experts, etc. In general, every team or service which is the first to arrive and provide assistance at the scene of an emergency. Concord is a state of the art system that supports and enhances the existing coordination and decision processes during an emergency helping the first responders to orchestrate the operation using contemporary methods. The Concord platform, by using EMS features, is able to coordinate an emergency operation successfully. 
The platform provides organization and user management system where all the team members can register in the platform. Incident management, where the command center can collect initial details on the occurring emergency, such as uh, the type of emergency, the first detected victims, among others, etc. A common incident space with interaction with maps, where the user can set markers indicating specific information of the incident. A decision support system with the recommendations on the allocation of EMS units to the incidents, allocation of patients to hospitals, allocation of available actors to tasks, and expected casualties. The event long service with uh, vital data coming from the field technologies, uh, such as uh, the drones, rescue memes, chemical sensors, etc. And the notification service, which triggers alerts on the upcoming field data in order to enhance the situation awareness on site. Here, it is described the whole process of the function of the Concord platform. When an incident occurs, the command center receives a call from the caller about the emergency and fills the incident form. This is mainly the incident management service. After that, the high commander sent dispatch notifications to every user and asked for all actors to go to the incident, act and collect uh, data. When they arrive on the site, every actor has a specific role from facing the threat, threat the victims to orchestrating with the optimist way the whole incident through the DSF recommendation and the situation awareness. The Concord platform can be used in many different crisis emergency. Some of the types of emergency to be tested are coming from the search and rescue project, the crisis management project with emergency, such as uh, earthquakes uh, causing situations such as victims under rambles, plane crashes causing explosions and forest fires, fires in the forest, chemical spills causing explosions and fires, terrorism attacks, heavy storms causing a communication breakdown. For the search and rescue pilot scenarios, the Concord platform is the main system that will coordinate the incidents and uh, receiving field data will improve the decision making and the situation awareness of uh, the first responders. But how can a first responder learn and be trained in order to know Concord functionality and the field technology input on it? In order to be able for the platform to be used properly, the users must have the appropriate knowledge for that. Thus, the training starts from the field technologies. The technologies which will be used in uh, in an emergency situation, as we mentioned before, and these are the drones, the rescue robots, chemical sensors, rescue memes, and gas detectors. For sure, the above technologies should be used by domain experts. The next step is the training with the Concord platform. Depending on the user role, the training is differentiated. The, role, the roles are command centers with uh, the high commander, field commanders, the PSAP, EMS rescuers, runner, and the retrievers. The user manual will include details for both field technologies and the Concord platform. For the field technologies, there will be details on the functional requirements and how the technology can produce data from the field. 
in a related way, details for the Concord platform will be included, but for the system functionality, as long as what the incoming field data indicates. More specifically, the Concord user manual navigates into the whole process of the operation from the command center approach, the field command approach, and the first responder approach. In order for the users to have an overview of the platform, as well as how it is used, there will be videos that will demonstrate possible use case scenario. Especially, they will include input from field technologies, especially historical data on past incidents, where the end users can see what kind of data they will see in an actual incident. Also, they will have the opportunity to distinguish the emergency orchestration via Concord's EMS features. And at the end, there will be a Q&A in order for users to, to be prepared for the next session. Of course, this session will be recorded for further usage. However, in order to be completely understandable to users how to deploy the Concord, the next part will include personal navigation on the platform, which means that the users will have the opportunity to navigate themselves into the Concord platform, making user and organization registration, navigating to DSS, in the event log, and the notification service, and then discussing open issues. At this session, the users will orchestrate the whole incident themselves without any instruction, and the final results will lead to another Q&A or a new session with uh, even better orchestration. The last training stage is the testing with, of the Concord platform and the field technologies in actual use. A real-time scenario will be held in order to see the actual work of the Concord platform and field technologies and the benefits of these technologies in a search and rescue operation. Moreover, the technologies will be evaluated by the users in order to provide their feedback for further improvement, gathering of all the historical data for future training usage, which means to cover up any misunderstanding. Thank you all. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you for this presentation of the, the platform. Before uh, we we go, um, to, we will go now. We we'll start uh, going to the different uh, search and rescue operation, and we will start with the uh, canine. Um, operation and specifically the training uh, of uh, certain rescue dogs. So, Anna, if you would like to, to take the floor and present uh, your activity at the Spanish School of Rescue and Detection with Dogs, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, Anna, do you want me to share the presentation or do you want to try to do it yourself? I sent you a request to unmute yourself also. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 I'll try to share my screen. Como se dice, no tengo permiso. Okay, now you should. Now, yeah, I, because there are two. Now it's possible. Like Thank you. Yeah. Solo one minute, please. Compartir.
It's okay, Anna. I will share it. No. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. Can you see it. my screen now? Uh, no, no, we don't see it. No, no, no. So, uh, I'm sharing mine uh, right now. Could you let me share the screen? I don't have don't have permit. Uh, I'm sharing the screen. Uh, can you see me the presentation? No. I can see the presentation now. It's okay. I will pass the slide. Just let me know when you want me to switch to the next slide, please. Okay. Thank you. Well, good morning. My name is Ana Aldea. I am an emergency nurse expert in, in intervention in emergencies and catastrophe. I am research at uh, ESDP, Spanish School of Rescue and Detection with Dogs. Um, uh, I am no expert in training dogs, but my colleague Susan Izquierdo has helped me a lot in the development of these slides. He has been a K9 instructor for 30 years and has a recognized career in the world of the rescue dogs. Uh, all members of the ESDP are volunteers with different expertise, but all of have the same common goal to train rescue dogs and help to save life wherever we are needed. Could the next, please. The SDP is an international organization. No, <laughs> uh, that's right. Thank you. The SDP is the international organization founded in 1996. Uh, it's a group of professionals dedicated uh, to work with search and rescue dogs. And this organization facilitates the train of search and rescue dog handles and assist in the search of uh, for people in emergency situation. Next, please. In fact, uh, the SDP is part of the Spanish user team called ERICAM. It's under the umbrella of SINSARAC organization and therefore directly depends on the United Nations. Uh, we take part of emergency aid continents of Spanish state. Uh, uh, inside and outside of the Spain in different headquarters uh, like Turkey, El Salvador, Morocco, Haiti, Ecuador, among others. Next, please. Now I try to describe the process of training and rescue dogs. In a short time it's difficult, but I try to do it. Next, please. The process from selection, uh, there are uh, four steps, uh, the selection of dog, teaching, training, and the last one is when the, the dog is ready, then is the field operation. The process from selection of the dogs to teaching and training is long and requires a lot of dedication. Canine Rescue Unit are made up of dogs that need to have special abilities, but they must be stimulated and developed in a focused manner, search for victim, drug, explosive, or whatever. The next, please. In order to detect the, the capabilities, the SP dog hunter carry out a series of tests when the dog is pupil to determine if they are suitable to search and rescue work. There are three important points in, in this topic, genealogy, characteristics assessment, physical condition assessment. Genealogy is important, but not decided. Uh, the environment, the learning dynamics, the external stimuli can make a difference. Genetics can be an advance when choosing a rescue dog, but not the most important thing. The morphological characteristics of the ideal dog are weight on, between 30, uh, 15 and 30 kilos, medium coat, athletic build, and high physical resistance. If we are talking about his behavior, he must be sociable, proactive, resolute, and have a high level of instinct. 
Next, please. Next. Animal behavior is an uh, complex concept involving anatomical and physiological elements in connection with the environment through behavior. The dog and the hunter must learn to communicate with each other. They form a true binomial. A relationship is established between them with both partners learn to speak the same language. Uh, uh, the, in the teach, uh, when we are talking about teaching, it's very important habituation and coexist, uh, empowering behavior. And next, please. A modification or innovation and learning and fix. Next. The next step is, is the training. Training is the process uh, by which dogs modify their behavior as an outcome of experience, which results in the development of the new knowledge through instruction, observation, study, and practice. And there are different disciplines within this training. Next. When we are talking about uh, search training, there are uh, several specializations with different trainings. Next. The first one is collapse structure, is when the dog uh, look for big teams under the rubble. Next, please. Land slides. Next, please. And we are, train, uh, we are talking about missing person. There are two different disciplines. The first one is venting search. And the second one, next, please. Is searching by other reference. Next one, please. A slow avalanche under the snow and dead bodies and human remains in earth or in water. There are two disciplines too. The next one. When when training our rescue dogs, uh, the other to be condition is associated with the rewards reviewed by the dog. The main issue for the dog hunter is uh, which of all the smell given off by our body. So what we are looking for is what the catastrophe rescue dog learns to relate mm, the set of other common to human beings their work. There are a multitude of factors that can modify the production of substances related to human odor, especially hormonal activity and nutrition. Next, please. The other we choose when training our rescue dogs depend on the type of work we are tracking the door for. Some of the, our dogs are specialists in detecting drug and explosive. In this case, the dog detects particulars of these substances carried by air, current through its sense of smell. When it comes uh, to rescue dogs searching for live victims, the smell that the dogs learn to detect are those coming from the exocrine glands or exhaled air in the breathing. The dogs uh, follow the other cone which is directly related to the direction of the wind, the dog hunter has to know this information as it is essential to know from which point he has to start the search work. Next, please. There are some um, uh, operational use. Uh, these are some of the situations in which the work of rescue dogs is fundamental. 
as it has been demonstrated that their efficiency in the search and detection of victims is very high, like missing persons don't have calls, the missing are not known to be missing, as a completed to the technological localization equipment. Next, please. Reduce search time, high efficiency and precision, and reduce the time spent in the risk area during the search. And next, uh, we, can uh, we can show the video. Please share for me. <laughs> I have problems with my PC, it's impossible to share. The video is in Spanish and don't have sound. I try to explain what happened in video. Uh, this video is made by drone. You can see here the two dog hunters. The victim is hiding in the rubble, silent and quiet waiting the, to be found. The victim usually is one of the members of the team when we are training. When all, the victim always has a toy of a chi toy in his hand to reward the dog when, the, when he finds him. Home on the left, we can see the handle giving the dogs the command to be alert so that the dog is ready to search. He starts to search until he finds the other cone that indicates where is the victim and where is located. He go around to find the other. And when the dog locates the common zone, he go straight to the victim. When the dog gets the victim, start baking to indicate where the victim is. The dog back several times to mark the victim. And after that, uh, uh, my colleague or the, the victims um, get the toy to the, to the dog to reward uh, for a, a good a job well done, sorry. And that's all. Thank you. Thanks a lot uh, for this presentation on the, the small uh, video. I think it helps us a lot to, to, to understand the, the training and the result that you achieve uh, with, with the dog. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Anna. Uh, I just want to see uh, if there are any questions uh, okay yeah thank you for the floor and um, after the impressive presentation of the morning i tried to take you with me um, to the mountain rescue site and uh, to a new approach to mountain rescue training um, we tried to do mountain rescue training indoor and we tried to make it feel and look like it is outdoor um, First of all, I want to take you with me on the scene. And when you think about, what do you think when you talk about mountain rescue? Probably you think about dangerous operation scenes. Yeah, you think about challenging conditions. This is um, the most likely impressions everybody has when uh, thinking about mountain rescue. But the reality is quite different. We are dealing with climbers and hikers, first of all. But we have paragliders in the air, we have cable cars. Um, we have motor and outdoor sports. We have even accidents at work in dangerous conditions, maybe in the woods, maybe in, in the mountains, uh, maybe in all um, sites which are um, heavily or um, difficult to uh, to reach uh, with uh, 
special approaches to. Even in the underground and in caves, as we um, experienced uh, 2014 uh, in the Riesending Cave uh, nearby Berchtesgaden in Salzburg, or special um, event on the grounds and in white water, and not only in alpine regions. The picture you can see was made 2013 um, and at the Danube floodings um, when we had to uh, rescue the persons um, you can see on the truck uh, in, the, in the water. So we have a, a quite different uh, scene to deal with. And uh, the German mountain rescue has to process more than 14,000 uh, rescue missions in a year. And nearly about 10, 11% of those are um, were in, in a company with uh, helicopters and they use airbound support. So airbound support and dealing with helicopters is a big deal in the mountain rescue, um, not even in Germany, but in all uh, Alpine regions. So look at this, the mountain rescue does not have uh, own helicopters or own helicopter crews. So we have to, to deal with different partners um, all over uh, the Alpine regions. They come from different companies and they have different crews. They have different operating manuals, different types of helicopters and not uh, last but not least uh, different company philosophies. Um, and the partners are not only dealing with uh, airbound rescue, they are even working on the ground. To, to meet this, we, we talked about um, different approaches. Um, and first of all, we did our training, the partners did theirs. Yeah, only at some special events, occasionally we trained together. Those trainings took a lot of time. They were very experienced because flight time is very expensive. And they became more and more etiologically difficult because of the uh, carbon dioxide. Um, they reach only a few members of the staff. You can only um, take some some uh, people to a helicopter and, and to the to the training and they depend on weather conditions if you have bad weather if you have fog if you have uh, rainy conditions or something like this um, you uh, are blocked with the training so we we cost a lot of money uh, for only uh, little results to solve all these problems we try to go in a new way and we invented a completely new training area. The idea was to be very real. The slogan is train as you fight. Um, the idea was to reduce risks as much as much as possible. Dealing with helicopters is, um, is dangerous and uh, can cause a lot of uh, injuries, a lot of incidents or accidents. Um, the idea was to be reproducible. If you work on a flying hel helicopter, every approach is a new approach. It is not comparable with the approach before because you have different wind situations, you have different uh, flight situations. So you cannot be really re reproducible. And the idea was to be re reproducible, to, to uh, be able to, to freeze a scene and to do it um, in the same way twice. We tried to bring all partners together in one training, at one training uh, scene, and we tried to establish a standard operation procedure. Um, what is not so easy if you um, think about um, different companies, different philosophies standing behind. We had to meet different mission, mission challenges, as I uh, showed you before. And um, we tried to condense the training time to be very effective, to bring a lot of uh, members of the staff in the training to be uh, very professional and to, uh, to have routine. 
How could we do this? We invented a new center of competence of German mountain rescue, which is uh, equally the center of security and training of the Bavarian mountain rescue. It is located in Bad Tölz in Upper Bavaria. It's about uh, 50 kilometers south of Munich at the rim of the Bavarian Alps. And you, you see a very transparent uh, hunger, which uh, um, is, um, it's transparent. You can look out, you have the sun in, uh, it has no heating. So in summer times it's warm, in winter time it's cold. Um, you feel like you are inside, but you have the advantage of being inside. So you do not have to suffer from rainy conditions or something like this. It should be, and uh, it developed to a complex training site. And first of all, for our classical mountain rescue missions with helicopters of all different types of operators. So uh, we we began with a with a standing helicopter on a cone on a pylon, uh, just to do uh, the hoist missions. Um, and the second step, we we uh, got some. Um, train operations with a moving helicopter, and we try to rescue people uh, which um, have been in, injured or blocked in, in, a, in a hiking scene. Um, the whole center developed more and more. We brought in cable cars and uh, we uh, trained the rescue from cable cars out of cable cars. Um, on the left uh, picture, you can see it airborne. On the right, see uh, you see it in a in a terrestrial approach um, by going over the cable and uh, trying to rescue the people in this way. So we had one training site for different rescue approaches. Now we have uh, meanwhile two flying helicopters in in uh, the hangar, which uh, use a crane system. Uh, it was not so easy um, to get it uh, in a legal way because we do everything which was not allowed due to German law. We work under, under a load, we work under flying um, items and something like this, but um, we have it now in a legal way. Everything is um, uh, tested and recorded and so we can do our work. As you see, we have on the uh, and in the background, uh, play, uh, uh, climbing sites, we have a, a house and a roof and, and uh, in the middle, we have uh, different approaches for rescue missions. Uh, we can um, operate rescue missions from roofs and on the right uh, picture, you can see even rescue miss missions from the trees. If you have paragliders, which uh, are, um, at, at a tree captured because of a missed landing or something like this. And you can do the work like this. As a complex training site, we um, are confronted with water rescue situations. We have a pool in the, in the hangar, which can be filled with water. It is uh, filled with water twice a year because it takes a lot of water and um, you have to um, be aware of all hygienic uh, problems. So we use it twice a year with a complex training program. And um, you can see we have a, a ground car on the left side. We have a ice situation on the right side with plastic um, um, paddles uh, uh, flooding on the water, which are very, very like uh, ice situation. And um, you have a, a possibility to, to a possibility to observe all the action even from the underground. Uh, we have uh, an aquarium situation um, on on the rear side, so you can go to the basement and look under the water line. We have uh, shafts and caves uh, for all that rescue situations in the very very shallow, very very dark, very. Um, close situations uh, which we are confronted uh, at cave rescue and um, we have um, 
we try to to bring in difficult weather situations we have a, a climate chamber which uh, can um, drop the temperature down to minus 20 degrees and um, you see on the left picture of the working in the climate chamber um, it's um, quite different to a rescue mission that normal temperature ranges because you you can have to face problem with your screen a screen of um, all the items you knew you knew you use sorry and um, with the temperature problems with the infusion with medical stuff and something like this and we try to do very complex um, medical rescue situations um, even with uh, physicians and um, we have a um, a hospital situation um, in the training site so you can um, process your rescue mission until you reach the hospital and you have uh, the connection with the with the hospital staff and can train even um, that situation. Now we have nearly 15 years of experience um, in the training side. We um, had a lot of development and improvement, a lot of uh, new items uh, we brought in the site. We, we have now a worldwide singular training site and we are very cert uh, certain that um, the training surroundings are near to reality. Yeah, the feeling is quite real. Um, the, uh, we have the wind from the downwash of the helicopter, which we can simulate with ventilators. We, we have the noise of the helicopter on the headset of the training staff, and you have no noise emission to, to the environment. You have it only on your headset. You have a lot of items um, which um, bring the reality near to you. We had no accident inside and out, in outside since we do that training and um, all our German and Bavarian rescue staff has to join the training once a year. Uh, the procedures and the cooperation with all the different uh, teams of the helicopters have absolutely improved. Our rescue members have got more routine. They are um, more professional and uh, they are um, more quiet in doing uh, their rescue missions, even in very challenging situations. And um, we are all together on the training center. All different organizations are working at the same scene. Uh, we are looking at the cooperation. We are um, improving our problems, our, our mistakes, um, and we come to to common and to agreed procedures and uh, to standard operation procedures. And last but not least, we avoided a lot of carbon dioxide emissions uh, because we need no flying he helicopter. We need no, um, uh, no time um, in the environment, um, even in uh, touristical uh, sites. We had a lot of problems with flying. Um, when all the people uh, wants to to recreate in in uh, the nature, and so we are at our spot, and um, it is even a good idea for nature. Nevertheless, uh, it takes a lot of work and a lot of money to keep it running, but I think it is worth to do that. So thank you for your attentions and. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me. I hope I'm in the time and I try to get out of the... Yeah, Was Jean, it? yes. Thank you, Clemens, for, for this presentation. I would uh, let uh, participants ask one question, but I just have to say that uh, we had the chance to, to, to visit uh, the site 
your training uh, site on the, it's indeed very, very impressive. <laughs> yeah. um, you, you are very welcome to, to visit us at uh, Patrels. Just let me know. Um, I will be there and I uh, will give you an impression of what we are doing there. As far as I remember last time when we visited it, um, you were also planning an extension. Yeah. Um, so just to uh, to uh, enlarge uh, your your training site. Yeah, but it's more more or less uh, it's um, rooms for for um, for presentations and so and the training site itself um, um, it is to be improved by by new items by new uh, by new possibilities of training. And um, what we are thinking about is a new building um, with classrooms and something like this. Okay, okay. Well done. <laughs> um, well, I do not see uh, any, any questions. So I think that we can move to uh, the mountain to the maritime uh, search and rescue operation and training for this. So Evangelia, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, from the Hellenic Rescue Team to, to present uh, training for maritime operation. Hello, baby. I'm just a moment to share. Okay, let's start. Okay. Oh, good morning to everyone. I'm Evangelia Temeridou, I'm head of the Water Rescue Department of the Hellenic Rescue Team. Today I'll be presenting to you the way the volunteers of the Water Rescue Department are being trained in search and rescue at sea. I will present who we are and what the Water uh, Rescue Department is about, and I'll also talk about our training procedures and an annual health national hands-on training course, as well as a case study counted in 2019. HRT is a non-profit organization founded by mountaineers in 1978. It was established as an association in 1994 and has been growing ever since in numbers, equipment and level of training. As of today, it counts about 2,000 volunteers nationally and 32 branches all over the country, with 17 of them active in water rescue. Our fields of operation are mainly water, mountain and urban uh, rescue, while also maintaining the first aid, social and humanitarian, radio communications and rescue dog departments. And now some more information regarding the water rescue department. The department was founded in 2000 and today it is one of the most inflation parts of the organization with numerous successful search and rescue operations. As a result, the HRT was awarded with the Nansen Award by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the most significant, uh, significant uh, recognition of any rescue team. The department's mission is to conduct uh, search and rescue at sea, rivers, lakes, flooded areas and anywhere else where a water element poses a threat to human life. Our 17 branches operate across Greece with 23 rescue boats and on the map you can see where they are located and the range each one of them can cover. So how do we train the volunteers in order to efficiently operate when needed? Our training program is based on the IMRF and IMO manuals, as well as on manuals used by some of the largest European rescue teams. We've divided the training into four levels, the introductory part of the basic training for the new team members. The first second part, and second part that is addressed towards the intermediate level members. And lastly, the third part that focuses only on our most experienced rescuers. Training is a continuous procedure. 
The duration of the basic school is up to three months. The first level has a full training course that lasts about six months and continues with training exercises, maritime patrols, and participation in operations that might come up during the first year of being in the team. The second level lasts two years, and the rescuers have to specialize in specific roles, be part of the training team for the newcomers, and participate in operations based on the specific roles they've gained thus far. Lastly, the third level has no time limit. From this point onwards, the rescuers are constantly learning, becoming full instructors, gaining more field experience, organizing trainings, and ideally, coordinate operation missions. Let's see the levels of training in more detail. The basic school primary aim is to educate the civilians so they can help themselves and the people around them in a case of emergency. Its secondary goal is to introduce the team and its voluntary work, showcasing the ways the new members can become volunteers as well. The newcomers are trained by all our departments so they can have basic knowledge of rescue techniques in all the possible fields of interest. The water department trains them in simply rescue techniques so they can help in case of danger in a water environment in an accident at sea. That includes learning theoretical rescue techniques from a sinking car, from a fall into an ice drift, a current drift, and dealing with hypothermia. Basic school also includes practical courses and exercises of self-rescue and use of rescue equipment such as live buoys, torches and flares, water survival te techniques and usage of life boards. On top of those courses, there is a hands-on lesson on the rescue board that serves as uh, an introduction to our rescue vessels. The school is completed when successfully passing the theoretical writing exams and the first aid practical and theoretical exams too. At this point, uh, the volunteers that have selected the water rescue department as their major training field begin the next level of training. Level 1 of training aim, aims at forming the volunteers into functional, well-trained rescue board crew members. At this st stage, they can also participate as backup crew members only when operating as swift water emergencies. This is achieved through 35 hours of theoretical and 35 of practical lessons. This level includes courses that focuses on how to gain the ability to keep yourself safe as a volunteer rescuer while operating, as well as learning to successfully evaluate the scene before actively getting involved, as to keep your team safe as well. The new members learn uh, how to read the nautical map, use a compass, and how to use navigation systems on the board. Search patterns are the most efficient way to search a person or a boat, uh, or a boat lost at sea. That's why the members are taught how to execute them while working as a crew. The train to become providers as basic first aid on top of learning how to psychologically help their teammates during and after an operation has taken place. They are taught how to act at a, simula a situation of man, so of man overboard and how to correctly retrieve a person on the rescue board. Personal, uh, here. Personal board and shift water equipment are all taught at this level as to their correct usage. The new members learn how to communicate and correctly use radio communications at VHF on maritime channels. and get their first introductory experience regarding rescue operations at rivers and flooded areas. Evaluation consists of both theoretical writing and writing exams and practical exams that take place on site. After they have successfully passed their exams, upon completing their first full year of training, they'll have participated in holistic training exercises, maritime patrols and operations. Upon entering the second level of training, volunteers now have to choose at least two fields to specialize in. Learning courses for every field usually last two full weeks with theoretical and practical exercises. The fields of exercise offered are 
as to speeding boat operators. Are the head of the crew while on board? The position requires an operator's license from the Hellenic Coast Guard. And afterwards, there are courses conducted by the team so they can operate the rescue boat in particular. Maritime navigators who are in charge of na navigating the rescue boat, plan search patterns, operate the electronic systems such as the radar, the thermal camera, the sonar and the GPS plotter while also being in charge of radio communications on board. Swift water technicians require a certification of res rescue 3 international course of how to safely operate in demanding waters such as rivers and sea streams. Jet ski operators need an opera operator license from the Hellenic Coast Guard and then are trained to operate a rescue runner, which is a jet ski specifically designed for a rescue used at sea and lakes. Rescue swimmers need a lifeguard license from the Hellenic Coast Guard. They are members of the rescue boat crew and they are the only ones allowed to get in the water in order to save a life. Equipment maidens and warehouse managers are those assigned to take care of all the equipment belonging to the water department and are the ones in charge of preparing, based on its operations needs, the equipment the crew members will use. Head of first aid procedures are always on board when operating, in charge of the crew, when they need to provide first aid at someone who's at risk. The position requires training and licensing from an external or our organization on how to deal with cases of multi-injuries and mass uh, search and rescue operations. Instructors are taught how to teach other adults, have a vast knowledge of the things taught at basic school and are the team members that will aid on training the newcomers. The second level is completed when the volunteers have successful, the, successfully passed their theoretical and practical exams on their field of, exercise, of expertise. I'm sorry. The team also requires them to have participated in at least 10 search and rescue operations, as well as supporting and helping out with the basic school and level one training course. The third level of training is addressed only to the experienced rescuers. That means they have gathered knowledge and experience on water through their years of volunteering by constantly getting trained, both by team and its external associates, while also being part of various operations. Internal school consists of learning operational maritime technology in English with a duration of two days training completing the second level of the HRT's first aid department that takes one month of training, as well as the first level of the HRT's radio communication department that lasts about six months. On scene coordination is a course on how to organize a search and rescue operation while in the field with more than one vessel operating at the same time. This course lasts about a week long. When applicable, exam must be taken, whether theoretical or practical. At this, uh, at this level, the rescuers have uh, at least one training from a foreign rescue organization, such as by taking part in an IMRA school exchange program or other similar programs. Participation in a week-long annually held program of water survival held by the Hellenic Air Force, as well as participation in the Hello Dunker School by the Hellenic Navy, a simulation of a sinking helicopter that covers the knowledge of how to safely evacuate it, where applicable a certification of completion is granted. Now we are going to talk about an annual national training held by the Hellenic Air Force and the Hellenic Rescue Team. The national training is held once a year around the middle of October and last three days of full training. One whole day is dedicated to air rescue training with courses run by military helicopter pilots and military officials on rescue by a military helicopter. This is both a theoretical and a real-time simulation of search and rescue with volunteers acting as the castaways at sea. 
Additionally, it includes a trial flight with the participation of the volunteers in order to get them accustomed with rescue techniques associated with air, with air rescue. The next two days, various exercises take place uh, within the military air force base with a plethora of training courses designed to fulfill the needs of rescuers. Approximately 150 rescuers from all over Greece take part in this training. That is held in collaboration with the Hellenic Air Force at 111 Combat Wing in New Angelos. Three rescue rigid inflatable boats and one rescue runner consist of the fleet, one could say, of vessels of the Hellenic rescue team participating in this training. In 2019, during the annual Air Force Rescue Training, a case study took place based on an experimental simulation by the name of 24 hours on a life raft. We took 10 civilians of all ages and walks of life without any prior experience or surviving at sea, put them in a life raft and left them to drift freely five nautical miles away from the shore for 24 hours. The scope and objectives of the simulation were to check the usability of a life raft and its equipment, the various survival difficulties within the life raft environment, the life raft drift depending on the weather condition it faced. It helped us test the positioning system and the digital communication used, as well as uh, the way the human body reacts in a 24-hour stay in a life raft at sea. The drill was implemented in real-life conditions as an experiment to test how different factors affect survival at sea. The factors tested in this real-life experience were the equipment consisted of the life raft survival kit, AIS mob transceiver, SAR transceiver, one mobile phone with GPS locator, GPS tracking device, one marine a VHF radio and their health monitors. We tested the, also the human factor, the weather conditions and the drift of the life raft. Six different crews of four, member, of mo four members participated with the crew changing every four hours. Furthermore, a rescuer from HRT participated as a member with the castaways inside the life raft in eight hour shift before and after the experience of spending a day in a life raft as a castaway, all participants were interviewed by a psycholo psychologist to evaluate the changes of their emotional state. Additionally, biochemical tests were also run of them before and after the simulation to better monitor their data. The simulation took place at the Bacassetti Gulf during the 24 hours they spent at sea. A rescue boat with the crew was constantly in a safe distance in order to keep them safe if the need arose. And when the 24 hours passed, they were salvaged by the very same rescue boat, returning safely back at shore. Two rescue ribs were used to patrol the life raft and six different crews with the crew changing every four hours. One mobile command and control center was stationed at shore and operated throughout the whole simulation. One base of operations located at shore as well, operating for the 24 hours of the simulation. For this project, HRT collaborated with the Hellenic Coast Guard, the 111 Combat Wing of New Angelos, the Hellenic Meteorological Service, the American Farm School, the School of Medicine of Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, the Emergency Medical Services of Greece, the Terra Spatium, a company of uh, geoinformatic systems for the tracking of the life raft's drift, and Lalizas and company of nautical equipment and life rafts. The results of the case study showed that the life raft drifted uh, 5.48 nautical miles in 24 hours, the biothermical, biochemical sorry, testings, found that the main reason for the tardiness of the subjects were hydration, dehydration and the immobility they had to endure. The lack of access to enough food was found not to be of major concern to the participants, mainly because the experiment only lasted 24 hours. 
The heart rate was found normal. The participants uh, took 100% advantage of the life raft's usability and found the life raft survival kit quite useful. The conclusion is that the first 24 hours are easily managed by the castaways, both physically and psychologically. But so if you have any questions, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you a lot for the presentation. I have one question, uh, not related to really the training, but to the number of operations that you have every year. Uh, if you have uh, some, uh, the number of maritime operations that you are conducting every year. Uh, it's not a standard number, of, yeah. of course, okay, but uh, we are. Uh, a country uh, with a very large uh, uh, coastline, so we have numerous uh, search and rescue operations every year. I can count them <laughs> or to give you a number like that, but uh, uh, really with the last few years with all uh, the rotation of the refugees, uh, that number goes larger and larger. Increase. Yeah. For the more. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, uh, thank okay. you. Yeah, Post yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you, Angelia. Um, so now we, we move to, um, to the presentation um, about out of hospital emergency medical uh, training for mass casualty incidents from the air and ground advanced life support and coordination center. Um, Hanna Maria uh, from the Madrid Community Emergency Medical Service will present uh, this uh, Spanish experience. Hanna Maria, the floor is yours. Uh, I see that she's unmuted, but uh, she might have problem with her uh, microphone. Anna Maria, we cannot hear you at the moment. Uh, I sent you a request to unmute yourself. I see that you're connected with another. Okay. Can you try speaking now? I I can hear you. Uh, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I share my screen? Yeah, I will give you the rights. Thank you. Can you see the slides? Yes. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, Mary. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Ana Maria Cintora. I work for uh, Emergency Medical Service of Madrid, Suma Guanguantu. And I want to share with you my, uh, the speech about the form in which we uh, train in our institution. Uh, we make a special training in mass casualty incidents. Uh, that involve uh, several, uh, all the first responders inside my institution. I mean, um, coordination center, um, ground advanced life support, basic uh, life support, and aerial helicopter health service. Um, this is a specific training for mass casualty incidents. Um, uh, we don't, uh, we don't not, uh, we don't make only. Uh, mass casualty incident is, is basic training. We make also um, training for Siberian uh, incidents, and also we make an spe another special for um, man-made hazards with uh, unstable focus um, that um, require a specific uh, um, attendance in the area. 
um, the basic training that is a mandatory for all the uh, workers in Subagongantu. It's because um, we have suffered uh, different um, mass casualty incidents in, in Madrid. Uh, Subagongantu is in charge of the assistance to the community of Madrid uh, emergency service. And uh, for example, we, we made experience, uh, we suffer the experience to attend the people, the population from um, Atocha explosion. And it, it's this type of incident that uh, we are, I want to share uh, with you the training. Uh, mass concept incident based on large number of casualties uh, because of the, na and the nature of the injuries um, affect uh, so much that it's not, it's uh, overload the attendance of the usual uh, advanced support in the area. Mm. The key points that we uh, develop in the training it's, uh, are about leadership and coordination, security, communications. Uh, this is a very important uh, point that we have uh, value in um, behind our experience in mass casualty incidents and also in the training because it's the um, it's one of the more difficult uh, difficult point. Uh, to develop in the area uh, for all the professionals because of um, in a mass casualty incident, it's usual to uh, get down the, the communications. So we, uh, we make a special training with um, Tetra Radio in terms of, of um, get the right and the minimum uh, information that uh, will uh, allow to, uh, to um, start the preparation of the attendance of a mass casualty incident. We also develop triage, uh, the assistance and the treatment in the area to the patient, and also Sumogon uh, Guantu is in charge of the transport and evacuation of the patient to a uh, an useful center, depending of the, um, the illness of the injury um, that uh, the patient offer. This, um, this training is based on Summa Concordia technical instructions and also the practical law that is uh, developed for this type of incident in the Madrid community. Uh, we have uh, suffered, as uh, everyone, I suppose, the COVID pandemic. So at the beginning, uh, previous to the COVID pandemic, we made this type of uh, uh, training face-to-face uh, -face in a special uh, way. But uh, with the COVID, uh, we have to part to separate uh, theoretical um, uh, lessons in an online way and uh, only to practice in the camp the triage and all the maneuvers and all the transport evacuation that it was um, a must uh, to get the best results. In each um, mass casualty training, receive a special primary training uh, to um, get um, the lesson learns from the, the training and also to improve the next uh, training. Um, in the, we, I, I show you the, the form in which we make the training that is the similar for the uh, way in which we um, um, confront uh, a mass casualty incident. In the coordination center, uh, it, it, uh, when we start uh, an alert of a uh, mass casualty incident, we, uh, there is a, a special group inside the coordination center to attend the calls and to uh, support the organization and management of the incident. An emergency nurse, uh, three technician, um, emergency technician uh, operators, and one uh, teleoperator from, uh, to coordinate uh, emergency uh, health service with other uh, corps, uh, security, firefighters, etc. Um, we we start with it when a uh, uh, um, alert start, and also we uh, receive and ask for more information to confirm the alert. Uh, we um, uh, we distribute uh, an, an alert uh, the number of resources in independent of the number of the victims. Uh, if, if there is less than uh, ten uh, patients. We uh, and only two or three uh, needs a uh, emergency uh, car. Uh, we um, um, alert to one advanced support, uh, two basic ambulance, and, and a specific uh, logistic um, track for it. 
and also the chief medical officer uh, go goes to the to the incident to the training incident yeah this is a, this is the distribution of the mass casualty incident in, in, in depending of the victims and the resources that we uh, start we um, alert in the training it depends of the if there is a special risk chemical biological or radiological uh, in which we um, also activate a special resources uh, for attending. I mean, we have a special uh, decontamination unit, and also we have a special um, CBN group inside our, our institution. And this is the, um, the structure of the procedure inside the coordination center to confirm the information and also to alert the, um, the head of uh, managers in in Suma and uh, coordinate with Health Council of Madrid. We have uh, uh, we are mar more than uh, three uh, thousand of professionals in inside a Madrid community, and uh, uh, we uh, alert uh, each uh, resources in in terms of the type of incident, the distance to the um, because the helicopter is um, alert when there is a, a, a long distance to the patient, there is a special risk for the patient, or there is, um, for, I mean, there is, a, for example, um, a, an emergency uh, um, in surgical attendance to the patient. We have two helicopters for attendance to the patient in the community and also for inter um, the transport with other communities. Mm, this is the this is the, the uh, organization uh, in terms of uh, attendance in the incident, in mass casualty incidents. Uh, it's a medical commander. We have this this specific vest inside uh, each uh, advanced life support unit. So we have uh, this vest to uh, use it in case of um, um, mass casualty. We have a special, uh, uh, it's called in Madrid, uh, Mesa de Enfermería, because it's the, the coordinator inside, uh, the coordinator between uh, hospitals and providing uh, support to get the, the best coordination and also to confirm the attendance of the patient inside the useful hospital. We use a special channel, uh, channel of uh, Tetra Radio, Sumacore 3, for, uh, for the communication between uh, medical commander and call center. We have another special channel for uh, Tetra Radio for the communication between all the rest of uh, uh, stakeholders and professionals involved in the area. Uh, we have we, pre, uh, we develop inside the training the zonification of the area um, uh, uh, avoiding risks for the professional that is going to attend and also uh, preparing uh, the correct attendance of patients they need a uh, decontamination or value and special risks as fire and others. This is the form in which we, the, uh, we distribute the areas inside the training uh, and also the, 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 the backpack that we use in the training that is similar uh, that we use in a, in a real life. This is the, the best uh, of uh, each profile um, the, the, of the medical commander, uh, the triage officer, this is the nurse. Um, I, I want to specify that in our training, we make uh, the similar as um, in a real life. Um, I mean, the first apparent support that uh, uh, becomes to the um, incident is not going to make an assistant, uh, an attendance um, um, tax the first offline support make a specific management of the of the disaster uh, is the second of advanced life support that attends in emergencies of the area the first triage make a special uh, life saving interventions with as tourniquets uh, drainage of uh, pneumothorax and others we use the start triage. We practice the start triage in the in our mass casualty incidents. 
with making uh, different priorities uh, in, in, in relation with the number of breaths, the position away, if the patient uh, present a radial pulse or not, and also the conscience status. This is our uh, triage car. Uh, we have a, this is um, our triage car. Uh, triage car is um, a history clinic that we uh, go, we present in the hospital with the patient. We have one part for us, a uh, one part for the patient um, within the maneuvers that and treatment that the patient have received. At the beginning, we start with the with the marking the the triage, uh, the first triage, uh, making a priority uh, in relation of the result of it, and also. Um, the resource uh, in, in form to the coordination center of the, the victim and the, and the state of the victim. And, and also it's preparing the uh, evacuate, evacuate in terms of the urgency of the patient. We have another specific for uh, bring uh, victims uh, to uh, organize it. Um, and, and also, uh, as I explained you previously, the, the, the first um, uh, advanced life support, uh, make logistic uh, tax in the area, and the second, make a health advance health card. Um, we have a, a specific tax for each profile, uh, doctor, emergency nurse, and terms. This is the, the second triage we make with a, making a stabilization of the patient, making a ABCD approach, uh, and also uh, the statin and treatment life threat uh, because uh, it's, uh, it's the focus. We use a revised trauma score triage. And uh, in terms of the, uh, the results of the second triage, uh, we mark the priorization uh, to go to, the, to a, a useful center. We have a specific um, personnel um, making uh, its tasks and also we change the profiles when we put the training because it's needed to uh, understand the requirements of uh, the other partners that are involved in the area. Um, apart from, from the mass casualty incident that we make uh, all professionals, uh, I want to share another uh, training that we made with other a corporate of emergency, I, I mean, uh, um, firefighters, um, a military um, corps, uh, and other. Uh, this is an example of uh, the, the training that was made yesterday in, in Zaragoza, another part of, of, the, of uh, Spain, with the uh, air uh, militars. Uh, also, we uh, Suma Kubantu uh, belongs to um, Erican, Spain user uh, uh, one team, and uh, we make an, a special trainings to uh, prepare the uh, international attendance in case of earthquakes and others. Also, we make uh, another trainings with a, a military unit of emergencies. This is an example of the last year, and. Um, uh, uh, the challenge for the future for um, for Suma Gwantu is developed in a in a in using new technologies, uh, looking for the um, the best uh, preparation of our professionals. We collaborate with uh, as a partner with Mer First Mer, uh, uh, that is a European uh, project uh, that uh, look for the best preparation of medical responders for stressful and highly complex disaster situations. MED use uh, innovative mixed reality for, uh, technology combiners, medical simulators with virtual environments. Um, uh, this uh, project started last year uh, and uh, it has been developed several uh, workshops uh, looking for the best uh, environment, uh, the environment of the area, and also um, the more important focus to uh, to get the best results from the mixed reality. 
I want to thank you all for you, your attention. I offer the references of this uh, speech in case you want to improve it. And I want to thank you uh, your attention. Uh, and also, I will be very happy to uh, reply all your questions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Anna Maria, uh, for this uh, also very detailed uh, presentation. From my side, I have only one question to you. <laughs> uh, it's about the, the, the frequency of the training uh, for this uh, specific uh, situation, mass casualty. Is it something that is done once a year? Or, I mean, what are your, your plans for, for this type of, uh, of training? It's a, it's a must for all professionals uh, one per year, but one there year. are yeah, but there are several editions so the professional could select the best uh, student for development, uh, and and also the specific uh, specific training for Siberian, uh, it's one per year, uh, and also um, so the training for um, Erican uh, user teams depends of the groups that uh, are in alert. Of the of each month, uh, so um, each training is dependent of the profile and and risks. Yeah. And a, another question that would be that would be all because we all know that uh, Spain has been affected with uh, I mean really large uh, incident uh, and drama with mass casualty. The, so. Did you change? Did you adapt regularly uh, your training from the feedback that you receive, or I mean the, the analysis that you are doing at, after each very large mass casualty that are almost like war situation? Right? Yes, we have uh, adapted uh, both of them. I mean, we we make drills with uh, SAMO. This is the other emergency medical service of uh, Council of Madrid. Uh, um, so we we have uh, improved our reply together uh, to uh, uh, confront a uh, future a uh, new new market short incidents and also we have developed an, uh, an special uh, training for biological risks as, the, uh, as you can imagine co uh, COVID. Um, um, it has been a very important training uh, past years. Um, Another, uh, we hope uh, um, not, not to have an other risks as COVID, but uh, we are prepared as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Anna Maria. And uh, I mean, we are following also the, the project Med First MR, so uh, we'll relay also information. Thanks a lot. Um, I think that is also a good transition to the next uh, speaker because uh, Anna Maria mentioned uh, CBRN uh, activity and the training that they are doing. So now we're going to have um, a last presentation uh, about uh, effective training for CBRN mission. And uh, it will be two presenters, Alexandru and Radu from ProEco, and they are really specialized in CBRN uh, activities. So, Alexandru, the, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Alexandru Dmitrashko, and on behalf of ProEco team, I will try to make a short presentation about uh, the training for uh, effective training for CBRN mission. Uh, the presentation, uh, the scope of the presentation is to outline the main topics regarding ways to improve efficiency of CBRN trainings. The topic refers to principle of training, identification of training classes, specific training objective and needs in case of critical infrastructure operators and first responders. The principle of CBRN training are flexibility, easy to be customized for different beneficiaries, complementary, modularity, ensure specific training needs by combination, focused on response emergency timing needs, and adaptability quickly 
adaptability, adaptability incorporate lesson learned from ongoing action, all, also open to best practices for CBRN incident intervention. Uh, very short, I will uh, present you, this is the classification of uh, critical infrastructure operators according to the Directive 114 for 2008 of the European Union. Uh, railways transport, air transport, maritime transport, electricity and energy distribution facilities, health facilities, nuclear industry and first responders. These are the main category to be learned. Effective training objectives are training of critical infrastructure operators, must enable critical infrastructure operators intervention teams to have the theoretical and practical skills for rapid intervention in the event of CBRN incident. Also, high coordination with partners outside the critical infrastructure site, authorities, experts, first responder, and avoid duplication of effort. First, responding, first responders effective training has to ensure a certified level of preparedness, readiness, and operational capability of to, to optimally intervene and act in response for CBRN trades. Uh, this I uh, will try to make a classification of uh, specific and general requirements for uh, different uh, beneficiaries. Uh, horizontal training uh, needs for critical infrastructure operators. That means all, all you can see horizontal and uh, means uh, CBRN awareness, CBRN terminology, improved commun communication capability with external authorities, improved communication cap capabilities with public, personal safety and security, knowledge about CBRN history, and also CBRN events recognition and the assessment of the associate level of risk. In the vertical, you can see also some specific requirements for each category of uh, critical infrastructure. For health facility, we have CBRN incident approach, CBRN awareness, CBRN terminology, terminology uh, collaboration improvement for, with first responder authorities, and so on. For rail transport, focus on the training should be generated training on CBRN incident approach, followed by CBRN awareness with specific topics of CBRN awareness on terrorist streets. Railway transport, uh, mostly CBRN incident approach. Energy production, production facility, focus of the training should be CBRN awareness, awareness, CBRN terminology, personal protection and safety, update of the personal retained procedure. For nuclear facilities, we, we have mainly CBRN terrorist streets, incident approach, and uh, superposition of manageable CBRN events. In the next slide, you can see the needs for training. Okay, only the main needs of training. Recognize the potential CBRN incident, take appropriate personal protection measure, and alert the appropriate response personnel. Recognize and respond, but not intervene to a potential CBRN incident while taking, taking the necessary precaution and calling in the appropriate specialized responders. Respond and intervene to an incident by mitigation and neutralizing its effect, as well as by taking direct action to save lives and intervene during a CBRN incident. The training program can at minimum to be structured in two levels. Tacti tactical for training the intervention teams of the critical infrastructure operators and operational coordinating and managerial level of the intervention so with team of external first responder, local authorities, experts and so on. The duration of a modulated course is maximum five days. 
theoretical activities covering 30% of the available, available time and 70% representing case studies, practical exercises, and so on. In exceptional cases, like uh, we have, unfortunately, unfortunately, the last two years, yes, epidemics and conflict, the course can be held online with the help of an e-learning platform under the guidance of trainers or, or automatically with the help of the computer for the theoretical part and case studies. Training program to ensure the correct use of equipment and the correct use of the operational intervention procedure. The course will be effective, uh, effective field exercise based on a specific infrastructure element. The scenarios uh, based on scenarios. Sure. The scenarios can be made can be made starting from one of the following working hypotheses. Green can be addressed by the operators of critical infrastructure autonomously without recurring to external intervention by security authorities or external first responder. Yellow can be addressed by the, by the critical infrastructure with the support relevant security authorities and first responder. Red cases which cannot be addressed by the critical infrastructure and its operators, and they have to be handled by security authorities or external first responders. Evaluation of the courses will be made, made by a questionnaire after each module and the final assessment questionnaire. Of course, all, the, all these courses uh, have to be certified and the final uh, uh, the organizer have to issue a graduation certificate. The, the guidelines for an effective trading for CBRN uh, are continuity, standardization, complementarity, and interoperability of training programs, wide accessibility, sustainability, goals oriented relevance based on risk, risk and or risk understanding, intensive practice to test, validate, and improve training, adapt, adaptable to lesson learned, and of course certification by uh, available in the uh, Union Europe, Europe, European Union. And these are the references. And that's all from my son side. Thank you very much. And uh, I propose you if you have any question to to ask us after the presentation of my colleague Radu. Thank you very much. Yeah, please, uh, please, Radu. Yes, okay. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> My name is Radu Andriciu from Proeco Romania. And um, uh, in the project Search and Rescue, we have a uh, use case six regarding the use of uh, CBRN uh, means by the terrorist in the terminal of a private uh, airport on Tuzla, Constanza, near the, the border of Black Sea. Then uh, it is necessary to have uh, prepared by training the first responder in this kind of uh, problem. Uh, then you can see now uh, the basic uh, document that uh, help us to do our job. He show you the importance of this kind of uh, a problem and uh, how you can uh, uh, build uh, online courses in the e-learning platform uh, now. Now you can see now the from a pedagogy point of view the principle uh, that uh, we use according to information society pedagogy, and the most important for us is uh, to integrate theory and practice and work and and team of course. The advantage of use a uh, online training course uh, in the learning platform system platform, you can see now. 
uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, advantage uh, who are uh, the, uh, use better the limited uh, resources that we have now. Uh, from the uh, point of view of uh, uh, using uh, a learning platform, you can see now uh, that we use uh, what share content object reference model that it is uh, for us very usable to learn that uh, uh, fulfill the requirement about accessibility, interoperability, durability, usability, adaptability, and affordability. Uh, the purpose you see now uh, of this course is that the um, cursant who are uh, B training, uh, they have a basic course in CBRN and now is, uh, they are specialized regarding in the, this uh, niche uh, about uh, how they can deal with the terrorist uh, CBRN attack. Le you can see now the learning objective. Uh, the fulfilling this learning objective, they uh, we can uh, give to the course and the competence, uh, practical and theoretical competence, uh, to do the job in the field. Uh, we ex uh, evaluate that we have maximum uh, uh, 16 uh, students per series, and uh, you see now uh, what you do before the exercise in Tuzla. We uh, training the private emergency service of Tuzla Airport, the medical staff of the Central Military Hospital, and of course uh, the Preco CBRN staff personnel. Now uh, you can see the uh, training method. Uh, is important to convince the course and to use uh, self-learning very much because they have a lot of material to their disposal, a study case, and so on. Uh, the thematic content of the courses you can see now in the module. What is important that uh, in each kind of uh, attack, it is from uh, radioactive substance or nuclear or biological or toxic substance, we have a lesson specific uh, that refer to the security and safety of uh, uh, measure for field responder because we uh, uh, invest a lot of resources, time, money, uh, intellig emotional intelligence and so on in uh, this uh, field responder and uh, we are very careful to not uh, lose them. Now, uh, it is about uh, five working days. In the last day, we have uh, uh, evaluation, that means a test. And uh, the fulfilling this uh, test, uh, they receive a diploma uh, to complete the course with uh, certificate the skills acquired. Uh, you see now uh, the time schedule. With, uh, when uh, we have a course with the trainer. And you see now that we have a session uh, when the, we uh, work in the synchron mode, I mean the trainer with the cursant together. But of course, if we, if, uh, we have a uh, asynchron uh, period, when uh, a cursant, for example, want to put the question, have something to discuss with the trainer, and they have time to do that. This is two. Uh, working format, synchron and asynchron uh, format. Uh, we have uh, also the possibility to uh, use it uh, without trainer, then they use it the computer. The difference is that we have a database when uh, in each four days the cursant downloads the material to have time to prepare. And uh, the final um, questionnaire, evaluation questionnaire, will be uh, made by the computer. And uh, our uh, usual uh, lab standard in Romania is that they must have a list seventh, uh, the not to complete the course. You can see now the references that uh, help us to uh, do the job that I described now for you. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to the ProEco team uh, to present uh, this uh, training for CBRM. Uh, I would just like to check if there is um, uh, any question. I do not see uh, any for this uh, for the moment. Um, so I don't know if uh, there are any further remarks that people would like to say just now. Um, I really hope that we offered, uh, uh, not of course uh, complete, but uh, already uh, a good overview of um, the different trainings that are um, uh, programmed and are in place uh, for the different uh, search and rescue operation. Um, as you have noted, uh, some of this uh, uh, special search and rescue operation will be um, further uh, developed in the different use cases of the project. Uh, and I hope that uh, you will uh, follow, uh, follow us for our activities. We'll for sure uh, present the result of the different use cases. So uh, there will be some possibility to share with you uh, the results. So I would like to, to thank you all because it was um, uh, a long but very interesting webinar and we had uh, a lot of participants. So thanks a lot to all of you. Uh, as uh, mentioned before, everything will be shared with, uh, with the participants. Um, so you will have all the presentations. Thanks a lot uh, for, for your time and for your presentation.